you step outside the war in Afghanistan, you're in a minefield and you're likely to lose your legs within the next five minutes. It's, it's definitely the biggest threat, but it is a threat that has probably been, uh, I guess, expanded upon because it is the, uh, it's caused the most casualties and it's probably something that uh, is very specific to Afghanistan and the Middle East in that um, it's something that the enemy has developed over time and it's become the, uh, their weapon of choice. Soldiers were trained as combat first aiders before they came out here, which meant that they could deal with significant trauma and were ready and apt and you know capable of dealing with it rapidly and precisely. We're not saving lives in the Resus Bay. Those lives have been saved a long time before people got to us. And that comes down to your average grunt and your digger, you know, with the support of their combat medic. We're a small nation with a small chunk of people here and you know, just look at CAF as a base. You know, there's at any given time between two and three hundred say people, Australians here, uh, participating in what we're doing. But there are thirty thousand people on this base and it just puts it in perspective. We're one hundredth of the population and in my eyes we we demand a lot more than one hundredth of the share of the you know, of the time of the commanders and the, all the different things around here. Even like the, uh, you know, the IDF attacks here, the, the first IDF attack that we had, you know, I could feel the adrenaline rush and, and you know, kind of the panic, you know, the internal, not really panic, that's, a, that's not the word to use, but you could feel the, uh, oh, am I doing it right, have I, have I got everything covered, is everybody okay, have I got the reports right, am I talking to the right people, you know, did I record that time? Have I done this? All the little things, just 100 miles an hour through your head. Now, we get a rocket attack and I'm just like, ah, oh, yeah, here we go. No, Wander no. over. Yeah. <laughs> Let's start again. So, I mean, the other night we had the, uh, the one the other night actually landed. It's the closest we've had to an Australian asset and personnel. And it landed within 200 metres of one of our aircraft that had air crew on it. They had the airload team loading it at the time. And we had people uh, literally in the bus just about to drive out of camp to go get on that plane. Five minutes later, they would have been standing outside the plane, 200 metres from where the rocket landed. And that was, that was the one two nights ago? Yeah. 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 That was the one that held up us coming back from TK. That's the one. Australians lean up here, then we can't pick them up and take them home. Otherwise, we move most of our people are moved to AMAP and then back home. So we've got a guy in Germany and we decide to move him home. Yeah. Just use Civi Air to move him uh, Yeah, that's right, Civi Oh, unless it's a big job, like, you know, the job in the, the, the helicopter crash yeah. and there's a bunch of guys killed and seven wounded. Well, that, they put on a dedicated C 17 and um, we took two crews and uh, one crew got off in Diego Garcia. Uh, air crew and medical crew, the other guys pushed on, packaged everybody up in, in there, flew back to Dodge, swapped the crews over, and we kept going, got back to Australia, put them into a hospital in Australia. How long have you been doing this, Trevor? Uh, 88 I joined, wow. 93 I came online as a regular Air Force, mm -hmm. and so since then I guess. And then I left in 87 to do anaesthetic training, so I've been reserved since then. Oh, right. So I come and go on. Jobs. Were you, were you uh, doctoring before you joined the RAF? No, no, I uh, together? joined the Air Force when I was in the um, last couple of years. Of my life. Uh, everyone's been talking to me about Role 2, Role 3 hospital. I still don't know what the difference is though. Uh, just level of care providers. So so traditionally, Role 1 is your, uh, like your RAP level of care, primary care, no surgical capability. Right. Role 2, where you've got your first level of surgical capability. Yep. And generally speaking, those places like TK, yep. Karen Cow and they're sort of more forward, and they do damage control surgery. So they usually got, um, it can be as little as one surgeon 
you know, one general surgeon, one FP surgeon, one anaesthetist kind of thing. Yeah. Good for the role three. Now you've got specialist level of care. You've got specialist surgeons, so you've got more of the pods. You've got a uh, general surgeon, maybe trauma surgeon. You'll have, um, you know, maxillofacial surgeon. You'll always have a neuro neurosurgeon, ophthalmology. Yeah. Um, some of them have got, you know, ENT, you know, urology, gynae, um, bigger labs, CT scanners. My name is uh, Darren Beltier, Commander of the United States Navy, and uh, I'm the Director of Medical Services and one of the radiologists. We have the CT scanners are really a game changer. These young guys who are injured otherwise would have exploratory surgery. No. I've uh, missed my little one starting school, I missed my big one starting high school. And um, I actually think, I personally, my personal opinion is the family's made the bigger sacrifice than, than we do because it's my wife's left with the kids and she's working, the kids are at school and they're worried about you and you know we're here potentially just doing the business so you just get into the zone but the families I think do it really hard. I think much harder. I think all the gongs are deserved by the families as much as by the division. Um, I've been in trying to learn very quickly Dari. Um, and I've, I've been we're doing well, well I can I can hold my own in a Dari conversation now with Patrick Minor, so it, it's good it holds a, a fair bit of weight because it, it, I guess it shows them that you you're trying to learn their language and showing them a bit of respect. Um, I mean the, the Patoon commanders have been excellent and you know I've developed very strong not only professional relationships but also personal relationships with the A and A. Um, in terms of you know the example of, of defusing a bomb um, we're trying to get the ANA out of the mines into doing that because uh, at the moment all they do is if they find an ID they'll uh, go up to it and pull the cord to the power source and then pick it up and bring it back to you which is which is really not ideal. Um, so what what would you do your first time that happens? Uh, yeah, don't, don't come near me. <laughs> but um, I mean they're, they're getting better and they're doing that, that less often which is which is good. We got approval to repair the one uh, that was a IED strike, it was an IED strike, it was just the IED went off beside the vehicle. Um, that was before our trip. Uh, when we got here, the inspections and everything had been done. Um, we got approval to do the repairs because there wasn't any uh, mobility damage to it. It was just sort of superficial bin damage, windows. Um, so we replaced that and that vehicle was back in service. Yeah. I haven't uh, worked a lot with other females, um, being in my role and being um, always posted to combat units. Um, they've just, uh, in the past few years or six, seven years, started letting females back into combat units, obviously not in combat roles, but in the support roles like mechanics and clerks and uh, medical staff and that. Um, so when I first got to see uh, I was one of only a few girls um, and I was the only female in the workshop and by the time I left there was actually two other mechanics in the workshop. Um, there is a few other female mechanics around. <laughs> it's this really sense of uh, women wanting to go into a combat role? Not out of my experience, no, and I don't. I'm, like, I love being in a role to support that. Um, in Australia, at both my units, I've been in, not in the combat roles, but I've been in the role where I've been in the back of an R, I've been in the back of an ASLO, I've been in the back of an APC, in a fitness track, rolling with the um, the combat engineers or rolling with the cavalry guys. Um, over here, being female, I'm not allowed to do that role, um, for obvious reasons. Um, but, no, it's, I just fully understand the dynamics. Um, I've never been one to campaign for women on the front line, and I never will. I. Uh, I definitely understand the dynamics and why we're not there. <laughs>
yeah, it's a, it's a big achievement, and uh, it's still baby steps. We've got a long way to go, and uh, you know, I can see this this happening for another four or five years at least. At least. So will you stay and see through? Oh, we're here until we'll be here until the end of June, early July. So that'll be eight months for us. Right into summertime. Yeah, and then uh, you know we'll hand over to the next team, which has already been identified. Yep. Um, these guys have come from the 8th, 12th Medium Regiment. Um, I got selected. Um, Chief Army to do this, and the same things happened again. They've just selected Lieutenant Colonel out of, out of Army Group, yeah. and the soldiers and, and officers and the NCOs will come out of the 4th Field Regiment in Townsville. How many you got, mate? And they'll do a rotation, and the next one will come out of the 1st Field Regiment out of Brisbane, and so on and so forth until we're done. Great system. Well, it works. Uh, this, And it's great for Australia. It's great for these guys because I'm now sending, I've got very junior lieutenants doing uh, the job of a very experienced. Uh, uh, captain instructors. I have young ma young captains doing the job of majors, and of course I'm ably supported by my warrant officers. Um, these young officers in particular, and the young bombardiers that are out here on the mentoring today, will be uh, will now are the custodians of the art of gunnery, of real steam gunnery. That we, you know, as we go digitised, this sort of gets forgotten. Yeah. These guys are going to be the next next group of masters of the art, and will be the next set of instructors at the school in years to come. So he'll check all three guns. The law report ready. Ready will get sent back to the OP from the to the CP. So he's just said ready. Okay. We'll go back to the OP. So we've got about 50, 60 seconds before this sort of happens, and then bang, it'll go off. On Saturday we had 17 helicopters fly straight across in front of us. The lowest was about three feet. Uh. The highest was was round about where they were the rounds were descending. Okay, we're firing. Yeah, yeah. Firing. Five rounds to go around. They're firing smoke and you're going to see big white flashes down the ridge. Here was. That's a kill. Yeah. You can see the impact down there, the smoke. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, he's checked it again. Good morning. There you go, he's finished his method. We have uh, an interpreter, Sonny. I don't speak a word of Dari and they don't speak a word of English. So Sonny is the vital link between, or well, for our job to work on. Does he find it challenging, translating engineering? Um, he's been interpreting for a while. Um, as long as you have a, a fairly slow dialect with them and make regular pauses so they can translate, you just don't unload a, a whole lot of information on the poor interpreter to interpret all at once. Um, so it takes probably twice as long to have a conversation with someone. By the time you say a small snippet, pause, they translate it, and then you keep going. It, it, it's frustrating, that part. But, yeah. There's a, a, a problem with a one of the soldiers who was accused of being corrupt. They asked, what would you do with a corrupt soldier in Australia? And I jokingly turned around and said, oh, I'd probably take him out the back and shoot him. Um, I'm pretty sure he was actually on the phone to his sergeant major to get a rifle and a bullet. No, 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 that's not what I meant. It was a joke, I'm sorry. So we don't have a sense of humour here. Um, let's talk about this. In, yeah, so it took about half an hour for me to explain the Australian process of what we do without the, well, what I call my sense of humour. They might not be in the frame of mind for a joke. Did you have to translate the joke? Or did, did they think yeah, it was funny? Yeah, yeah. Oh, in the end, they, Colonel, Mahab, Colonel Muhammad turned around and said, oh, well, we won't shoot him because none of our guys can shoot straight, so we'll take him up to a helicopter and throw him out. <laughs> That'll work. I've broken up to uh, a number of components, I guess. Um, down here we've got um, a little restaurant down here, an Afghan restaurant, which is quite nice. Uh, the food is uh, very good. Uh, we've got a couple of little shops off to the side there. You know, we can buy DVDs, videos, and all the little bits and pieces. And then we can. We're probably a little bit restricted in our uh, uh, our personal, you know. Uh, yeah, well, there's, you there's know. no sort of. We don't, no, you know, you don't have, don't have a shop. Like toothpaste. Sure, okay, stuff. who's going home to Aussie House or whatever, yeah. you know, uh, and, you know. Absolutely. Take, you know, some toothpaste.
Yeah. The air is so dry here and everything like that. Uh, when you first get here, the you know, harsh, yeah. and, the, and the water's harsh. Uh, Very harsh. It's, you know, the guys you, you are ordering it. bottles of hand lotion yeah. and body lotion. Yeah. 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 Get the skin problems that you <laughs> never realised that you you'd get before. So yeah, look, you know, these bubbles here, you might have noticed they're, they're being joined together. So we've got them doing that as well, so they give us more room. Moving over the side, over this side, 318, where you can see there, that's our gymnasium. They can go down and do their personal fitness. We've got runner machines, weights, that type of stuff in there. So it's quite good. Over behind it, uh, which is our uh, the uh, the larger building, that's where we do all our main lectures and everything like that. That's set up, you know, we've got uh, uh, computers and, and so forth in there so that we can uh, run a light pro uh, presentation. It can hold up to 250 uh, people. Um, on one screen we'll have the English version and the other we'll have a Dari or Pashtu version. Um, it's a pretty good facility. Very lucky to have it. Very lucky. <laughs> I don't remember that. Oh, goats. God knows. Is there a, are there peak hours in traffic or is it always pretty much? No, there are peaks. Yeah, yeah, yeah pretty, pretty much. much figured. It's a bit thicker. Yeah, right. There's no speed limits. Uh, there's no road markings. A lot of the roads are just dirt full of potholes. If you can get six cars going heading in one direction, you will. And four person coming the other way, too bad, so sad. Get off the road, get out the way because they're coming through. And unfortunately, it's not just the uh, Afghans or the local nationals. It's the Americans are getting just as bad as the uh, local nationals. Driving their MRAPs and just on in a big vehicle, so you get out of my way. Yeah. Yeah. I've heard other people say a similar thing, and uh, there's a bit of. Um Bit of lack of discretion about who they point their laser at. Yes. King of the road sort of thing. Yes, yes. Um, not too sure if they're trigger happy or they're just trying to use their viewfinders to get a picture on the screen of who's in the car or not. But I've had a few remote weapon stations pointed at me at times, approaching from the rear. They can't see who's driving it. The amount of mud on the windscreen at the moment. <laughs> they're showing due caution. Yeah. I've seen Afghan kids in various places and um, you know they're, they're good kids, they're, kids are just kids and the whole idea I remember I read something by General Petraeus I think it was that said um, I mean the whole reason we're here is to stop this generation of kids fighting our generation of kids and I look at my seven year old son and I look at these seven year old kids in the market or in these villages and you know, places that, um, that we, where you see kids and you know I don't want those kids fighting each other. So, I mean, it's probably the reason we're here is just to, to prevent that happening, to hopefully come to some sort of understanding that's uh, uh, acceptable to the Afghan people and also to the international community. It's a big one. Afghanistan's a big one. It's going to go for a long, long time until, until we get that solution. <laughs>